we came across a paper that you had published um, showing changes in these, again, long non-coding RNAs. Um, and one of those was USP30 um, AS1, which is, uh, we know has impact on USP30 gene. And we make USP30 inhibitors. So it was a very kind of, uh, you know, as, as we're looking through the literature, I tried to read everything that has to do with the target. Um, and COVID-19 comes up, obviously, you know, we are focused on neurodegenerative disease. We're focused on kind of age-related diseases. And COVID-19 is something that is, I think, you know, now we're kind of living with it as an endemic. And I think we're, we're going to probably see a lot of instances of, of long COVID happening. And we're not the first people to say COVID targets the mitochondrial. There's been other kind of smaller papers and ideas out there on that. But this paper is going to be probably the most comprehensive look at it because we're looking at different organ impact and, you know, not just the nasal swab. And definitely we see that um, it makes sense, too, with the people who are more susceptible that COVID really, SARS-CoV-2 really targets the mitochondrial. So we can, what we see in this work is that the heart, for the people who have died from, you know, the virus, the heart completely shuts down the mitochondria. You know, that's pretty amazing. You see across the board, all, all the oxfos complexes, metabolism, everything is completely shut down. And other organs are following suit, but this kind of a uh, interplay, like at the point when the patients uh, had died or the people from SARS-CoV-2 had died, the lung now over, over, tries to overcompensate and increases mitochondrial activity mm. at that point, you know, but the, it's too late by that time because the heart's already shut down the bioenergetics, you know, the, one of the most bioenergetic organs in your body shuts down. Um, we had in this paper, we have data from hamsters study and we had looking at the cerebellum and the striatum from that who are, you know, inoculated with the virus. And the hamsters do a pretty good job to clear out the virus themselves, that animal model, but they still get infected sex. So it's kind of compared to a mild infection, I would say, from a hamster. So that we, we did say, for example, in the cerebellum after, let's say, peak viral load, you know, this is like four days after infection, um, into the hamster model, we saw like the cerebellum kind of mimics the heart. It completely shuts down the mitochondrial while like other parts of the brain, like the striatum, now is over, trying to overcompensate, so it increases mitochondrial activity. So there's this huge mitochondrial interplay that I think people should really pay attention to. It makes sense. The more susceptible people tend to be people that you know will have mitochondrial decline, like aging, diabetes, and obesity, and things like that. And of course, not people not in that category probably have some mitochondrial dysfunction to um, caused by SARS-CoV-2 to do that. And our theory now with long COVID is, which we're trying to get samples and data and, and collaborates more and more to work on, is that we think that damage done in the mitochondrial, and depending on the degree done, could probably contribute a lot to what we see with long COVID and the brain fog and related, because we know mitochondrial suppression happens that could really con contribute systemically to fatigue and the CNS issues, as you know. Do you think, uh, I guess, do you think, and if, if so, at what stage do you think it would be beneficial to maybe have something that can enhance the removal of damaged mitochondria, which is, you know, the type of small molecules that, that we're developing? Would that be kind of earlier on in COVID when the initial, you know, mm -hmm. The, the initial damage is happening, or would it be beneficial maybe later for long COVID after people have been trying to recover and maybe not successfully so? I could say, I mean, depending on the mitochondrial improvement, you know, it could be a kind of a preventative in a sense. Let's say if you have some kind of small molecule that could um, reverse the suppression that has a mitochondria once you're infected, I'll say take it, you know, if there's something improved right now, I don't, I'm, we have nothing to try to show for. I mean, granted, there are supplements that we know in the clinic, as you know, but you could take and it increases your mitochondrial activity. Would that help with COVID? Um, we probably have to do studies to see if it does, but I think it's worthwhile looking at. I think with long COVID, it would have a benefit too for those patients, um, in, in my opinion, because you know, I, I have no data to show it one way or another, but I have sure. enough like background data to say maybe this, it, sh it, should, it should be definitely an avenue we should research, you know, whether it comes out of anything of that, I don't know, but I think it would probably either way, I think it'd be really promising to look at. All right. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. This has been great. And uh, I'm sure we'll have other follow-up questions that other people will ask. So maybe we'll do a follow-on at some point. Sounds great. Thanks for having me.